last podcast, we talked about the road to World War I. We thoroughly discussed the five-year plan under Stalin as well as the Spanish Civil War before moving on and talking about the rise of Mussolini in Italy and the rise of Hitler and the areas that Hitler invaded and the rest of Europe did nothing about, did nothing to stop or prevent it from getting worse because the entire world is afraid of another world war. So as you can see, here are the areas that are occupied by Germany as well as the plan between Germany and the USSR um, that was the Nazi-Soviet pact to divide Poland between the two of them. So, you're caught up now. But we're also going to talk about the rest of the world and how Asia is involved in World War II. We're going to start with the Manchurian Incident of 1931. What you have are ultranationalists that believing Japan could end its dependence on foreign trade, but only if they had a colonial empire in China. And this actually goes back even prior to World War I, because don't forget, after World War I ends, Japan does have colonies in Africa that belonged to Germany. They have some influence in China, again, that had belonged to Germany, but Britain prevented them from expanding their empire in China. And that does leave a bit of bitterness between Britain and Japan, a bit of hostility, if you will. In 1931, junior officers in the Japanese army who were guarding the railway in Manchuria created an explosion on the railroad track. And the reason for this, the purpose of this, was basically just to give them an excuse to conquer the entire Manchurian province. And the Japanese government acted on this after the fact uh, of, of the explosion and even after they knew that these young officers had created the explosion themselves, that it was not a foreign power, it was them. And the League of Nations condemned this. But the Japanese simply removed themselves from the League in response. So we have another similarity here between what Japan is doing and what Hitler did. And you can really see just how for lack of a better term, weak the League of Nations is. They set up these guidelines. They see countries flagrantly disregarding these gu guidelines, and they don't do anything. And not having the power to stop it is one thing, but being so terrified of another war is another. And that's the true reason why they're not doing anything. Japan built heavy industries and railways in Manchuria and northeastern China. They also sped up their plan of rearmament in terms of building up their military and making them stronger. They have a very strong navy. Obviously, it makes sense. Uh, and at home, the government grew more authoritarian. Mutinies and political assassinations committed by junior officers brought generals and admirals into the government positions that had formerly been controlled by civilians. So now you actually have the military running the government. And that's not what you want. The main challenge to the government of Chiang Kai-shek, so we're moving on to China now, came from the Communist Party. And the Communist Party cooperated with the Guomindang until Chiang Kai-shek was arrested. Uh, or sorry, until Chiang Kai-shek arrested communists. And then he also began executing communists. And this forced the, the communists who did survive to flee into the remote mountains of the Jiangxi province in southeastern China. But in walks Mao Zedong. He lives from 1893 to 1976, and humble beginnings. He is the son of a farmer, but he's a man of action, and he becomes the leader of the Communist Party in the 1920s. So again, you can see a similarity between two leaders, Joseph Stalin, son of a shoemaker, Mao, son of a peasant farmer, humble beginnings, but very intelligent people who are able to connect with the common folk. And because Mao is able to do this, 
he is able to become a leader within the Communist Party in the 1920s. In Jiangxi, Mao departed from the standard Marxist-Lenin ideology when he planned to redistribute land from the wealthy to the poor peasants in order to gain peasant support for a social revolution. So what's happening in the USSR is Stalin is trying to gain support from the industrial workers. Mao's doing so from the peasants. Mao is an advocate of women's equality, but the party reserved leadership positions for men, and their primary task was war. The Guomindang army pursued the communists into the mountains, and Mao responded with guerrilla warfare and with policies designed to win the support of the peasants. Nonetheless, in 1934, the Guomindang forces surrounded the Jiangxi base area and forced the communists to flee on the Long March, which then brought them much weak much weekend to Shanxi in 1935. So just to give you a background of what's happening, what's going on, where are the marches, where are the battles? And here you have Chiang Kai-shek and Mao Zedong. On July 7th, 1937, Japanese troops attacked Chinese forces near Beijing forcing the Japanese governments to initiate a full-scale war invasion against China. The U.S. and the League of Nations made no efforts to stop the Japanese invasion. And the Chinese troops, they were poorly led and very poorly armed. A number of them didn't even have weapons. Were unable to prevent Japan from invading and controlling the coastal provinces of China, as well as the lower Yangtze and Yellow River valleys within a year. The Chinese people continued to resist Japanese forces, and that pulled Japan deeper into an inconclusive Chinese war. In the conduct of warfare, the Japanese troops proved to be incredibly violent, committing severe atrocities when they took Nanjing or Nanking in the winter of 1937 to 1938. They had a kill all, burn all, loot all campaign in 1940. In class, we will discuss the atrocities that were committed in Nanking. And the hundreds of thousands of people, we're talking about 300,000 people in a very short time period who died in ways that you cannot even begin to imagine. In class, we will have that lecture. It is something that we need to talk about, and it's it's not pleasant, but you need to know it. So look for that next week. The Chinese government of Chiang Kai-shek escaped the mountains, where Chiang built up a large army to prepare for future confrontations with the communists. In the Shangxi province, Mao built up his army, formed a government, and skillfully presented the Communist Party as the only group in China that was serious about fighting the Japanese. So here are some some names and some faces that you should know. You have Emperor Hirohito and the Prime Minister Tojo in Japan, Benito Mussolini, and Hitler. Allied leaders, so we've got Two, for the UK, we have Neville Chamberlain, followed by Winston Churchill. Franklin Roosevelt, who dies very shortly before the war is over, followed by Harry Truman. And then Joseph Stalin. World War II proceeded in two phases. The Germans invaded Poland in 1939 with a new form of warfare, the Blitzkrieg or Lightning War. World War II, with the introduction of motorized weapons, gave back the advantage to the offensive. And this is obviously seen with Blitzkrieg, but also in the use of American and Japanese aircraft carriers. The Germans overran Denmark, Norway, Belgium, Holland, and northern France in 1940. In the Battle for Britain, the Luftwaffe, which was the German Air Force, bombed England in preparation for invasion. Again, this is what total war is. Britain rallied around Prime Minister Winston Churchill and his encouraging speeches. Southern France was controlled by a French government that collaborated with the Nazis. Charles de Gaulle formed a free French government in exile in London. 
In many countries, there were underground resistance movements. There was also war in North Africa and Southeast Europe. The size and mobility of the opposing forces in World War II meant that the fighting ranged over vast theaters of operations, that belligerents mobilized the populations and economies of entire continents for the war effort, and that civilians were consequently thought of as legitimate targets. Again, all of these are what total war is. This is the very definition of total war. When you have private citizens being mobilized to enlist in the military generally that's done with propaganda otherwise it's also done with the draft system you have citizens towns villages being targeted being seen as a way to win the war hit the enemy where it hurts it took less than a month for germany to conquer poland after a lull during the winter of 1939 and 1940 Hitler went on an offensive in March that made him the master of all Europe between Spain and Russia by the end of June. <clears throat> Hitler's attempt to invade Britain was foiled by the British Royal Air Force's victory in the Battle of Britain from June to September of 1940. In June 1941, Germany violated its pact with the Soviet Union and invaded. In 1941, Hitler launched a massive invasion and while his forces were successful at first, Hitler apparently learned nothing in his history classes because German forces were stopped by the winter weather of 1941-42 to and gave up trying to take Moscow. They were finally defeated at the Battle of Stalingrad in February of 1943, and this was the failing battle in, in Hitler's last chance of winning the war. You don't invade Russia in the winter. In Africa, the Italian offensive in British Somalia and Egypt, which was initially successful, was turned back by a British counterattack. German forces came to assist the Italians, but they were finally defeated at Al Alamein in northern Egypt by the British, who had the advantage of more plentiful weapons and supplies and better intelligence. So here we have major battles as well as major events. It's a little blurry, I know, so you might want to pause this or just pull up the PowerPoint on the classroom. Take a look at it. Meanwhile, war in Asia and the Pacific. In July 1941, France allowed Japan to occupy Indochina, and the U.S. and Britain responded by stopping shipments of steel, scrap iron, oil, and other products that Japan needed. In 1941, the U.S. did not fight back, they did not join in the war, but they agreed to supply arms to the British because of close trading relations. Roosevelt and Churchill agreed to the Atlantic Charter, both affirm national self-determination. The U.S. guarantees moral and material support to Britain. Roosevelt and Churchill agreed to this Atlantic Charter, mostly for economic gain on the U.S.'s side, and Britain needed assistance on their side. In six months of offensives prior to Midway, the Japanese had triumphed in lands throughout the Pacific, including Malaysia, Singapore, the Dutch East Indies, the Philippines, and numerous island groups. The U.S. was a growing threat, and Japanese Admiral Yamamoto sought to destroy the U.S. Pacific fleet before it was large enough to actually outmatch his. In response, the Japanese chose to go to war, hoping a surprise attack on the U.S. would be so shocking that the Americans would accept Japanese control over Southeast Asia rather than continuing to fight against, against Japan. Japanese propaganda declared a Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Spear, which would free Asians from Western imperialism. In the summer of 1941, tensions between the U.S. and Japan increased. Not sure how that happened. And Japan attacked American forces at Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941, and proceeded to occupy all of Southeast Asia and the Dutch East Indies within the next few months. The direct attack on U.S. territory, because remember, guys, Hawaii is not a state yet, led the American people to join Roosevelt in the call for war. So this plan backfired dramatically. The Allies took the offensive in the Pacific in 1942. Mm -hmm. They took control of the Burma Road from Japan as well. 
By June of 1942, after a four-day sea and air battle, the U.S. had destroyed four of Japan's six largest aircraft carriers. Aircraft carriers were the key to victory in the Pacific, and since Japan did not have the industrial capacity to replace the carriers, the Japanese were now faced with a long and hopeless war. The U.S. only lost one carrier, the Yorktown. This epic fight would be referred to as the Battle of Midway. Japan's losses hobbled its naval might bringing Japanese and American sea power to approximate parity and thus marked the turning point in the Pacific theater of World War II. So what we have here are these carriers being destroyed. You also have a photograph from Pearl Harbor. And as you can see, that's also the Pearl Harbor Memorial um, that is the Arizona that they were never actually able to bring it up. And rather than try to, um, they built a memorial over it because the other thing is that is the final resting place of a number of U.S. sailors. The end of the war. By 1943, the Soviet Red Army was receiving supplies from factories in Russia and the U.S. Churchill. Roosevelt and Stalin met for the first time in person in, in Iran in 1943. The defeat of Germany on June 6, 1944, when the Allies invaded Normandy. The Soviet offensive in the east, combined with Western invasions of Sicily and Italy in 1943 and France in 1944, defeated Germany in May of 1945. By May of 1945, American bombing and submarine warfare had devastated the Japanese economy and cut Japan off from its sources of raw materials. While Asians who had initially welcomed the Japanese as liberators from white colonialism were now eager to see the Japanese leave. The atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in August of 1945 convinced Japan to sign terms of surrender early the next month. Hundreds of thousands of civilians died in the atomic bombings, and Japan continued to fight until September 2nd, 1945, forever referred to as VJ Day. However, some world leaders wondered if the atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki was actually necessary. U.S. government officials argued that it ended the war a year earlier than it would have without it, and that it saved hundreds of thousands of American soldiers' lives. Winston Churchill, on the other hand, claimed that Japan was already all but defeated before the first atomic bomb fell. You should also know that after Franklin Roosevelt died, Henry Truman was brought in, and that was the first decision, the first major decision for the war he had to make. And what you can see is the mushroom cloud, and the photograph below it is pretty powerful. You can clearly tell it's the outline of a man with a cane. And this is what we would call a flashpoint where somebody was vaporized instantly when the bomb went off. And that's all that's left behind. So what we have are the furthest advances in Japanese conquests, Allied-controlled territory, and Allied advances as well as Japanese-controlled territory by the time they surrendered, and territory gained by the Allies before Japanese surrender. All right, we've got one more slide to talk about. Collapse of the Guomindang and the Communist Victory. After the Japanese surrendered in September of 1945, the Guomindang and Communist forces began a civil war that lasted until 1949. The Guomindang had the advantage of more troops and weapons and American support, but its brutal policies and its printing of worthless paper money eroded popular support within China. The communists built up their forces with Japanese equipment gained from the Soviets and American equipment gained from deserting Guomindang soldiers. They won popular support, especially in Manchuria, by carrying out a radical land reform program. On October 1st, 1949, Mao Zedong announced the founding of the People's Republic of China as Chiang Kai-shek's Guomindang forces were driven off the mainland to Thailand. And 
Taiwan, excuse me. And you should know, guys, this is where the one China policy comes from. For years after this, Taiwan was referred to as China. But when relations against um, relations with the U.S. and China and China and the rest of the world begin to go on the mend, there is the one China policy where the world recognizes the People's Republic of China as the true China and not Taiwan. All right, we're going to stop there for today. Tomorrow, we're going to pick up with the characters and the science and technology of war. See you guys later. Cheers.